Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, the uh, directors are trying to become ever more familiar with uh, their iPads. I want you to know that uh, the staff has done me a great service. I've got both an iPad and a paper copy. In fact, we're going to try that for two or three months just to make sure that we can have as effective a transition as possible to the digital world. Still have some paper copies that uh, some of you may want to look at uh, if, uh, if the subject comes up. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to call to order the regular business meeting of the OBA board for Tuesday, June the 17th. I note that all the directors are present. The treasurer is present. Our secretary is uh, backpacking in the Sierras. And so we have a quorum. May I uh, ask for a motion to adopt the meeting agenda? Moved by Andy Altman, seconded by Bob Giddings. All in favor? We have the agenda adopted. And we're really pleased as our first item on the agenda to have the uh, president of the uh, Oakmont Golf, Golf Club Board of Directors, Frank Giannini, here to give us a reprieve on all the significant activities that the golf club has been involved with through their water projects, management changes, and the like. So Frank, it's really a pleasure to have you. Please take time to bring us all up to date, and then you may get peppered with a couple of questions. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, showing you what we've done here made a drawing for all the native grasses on the two courses. These native grasses are going to be kept at about a four inch. They're not going to be replanted. They're going to keep the existing grass and maintain it. Our crews will maintain that grass that, are, that come adjacent to the houses. And basically this is where it all is. So you get a chance and you want to take a look at it. Where the native grasses are. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you get a chance, uh, take a look at that, and that'll give you some idea of where the native grasses are, and they're going to maintain them. Our our crews will maintain those grasses that are adjacent to the houses. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that we finally got a general manager for the golf course. He'll start on the 23rd of this month, and his name is John Ash. He's from uh, Calippi Golf Course, which is over in Pleasanton. He's got about 25 years experience, and uh, we're really looking forward to having him. It's something that uh, the club hasn't had uh, with our previous business partner, uh, Empire, but uh, we're looking forward with our new business partner, Kemper, to have this general manager. He's going to make a big difference in the club, and he's really interested in bringing it to the next level. Uh, our food and beverage, as you all know, is, uh, well, maybe you don't know, but it's doing very well. And because of you people, uh, we're, we have the residents of, Oak, uh, of Oakmont going there and eating and drinking and doing what they do. Uh, but it's made a big difference in our uh, profit and loss sheet. And we thank you for that, uh, especially on Mondays when we have our $6 hamburger and our uh, Tuesday tacos. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty good buy at any restaurant. Um, we're uh, planning through our task force of the uh, OVA and OGC, uh, planning a maybe another picnic type thing like we had last year with the parade for our 50th annual. We're planning another major picnic for the area, similar to what we did last year and uh, it's in the planning stages right now, and once we uh, 
get it finalized, we'll have a date. We're, we're looking at somewhere around May 31st of next year. But uh, that's, not a, that's not carved in stone yet. So uh, we'll be sending out stuff as that thing progresses. Um, you might have noticed that the uh, golf course is a little bit brown, especially the west, because we had a, we had a breakdown with our transfer pump uh, on the east course which didn't allow this to carry the water from the east course over to the west, which we normally do. We fill up the lake on the east and transfer the water to the west so that we can get enough water to do all the watering. Along with the fact that we are not totally through calibrating the computer I system that allows the water to be watered uh, watering the lawn all over the golf course. Uh, that takes, um, I would say, another two months to get it calibrated to where the water is fed to the grass the way it's supposed to be. And, th and this will, we, this is where we'll pick up our savings on our new system. Um, We uh, are also doing a karaoke night, which I don't know if any of you have attended, but it's a real nice affair, and uh, a lot of people are getting up and singing and dancing, and it's a lot of fun. So, with that, if, uh, oh, one other item, it's a major item too. It has to do with the well that we're contemplating putting in. Uh, if in fact I've got a couple of more things to investigate as far as uh, water goes. As you all know, by the end of this year, uh, we'll no longer be able to have the city water, which we get now. And that supplies the water for the West to be able to have water from May to September to keep everything fairly green during those critical months where we don't have, where like we are now, we're in kind of a mediocre drought. Uh, so it's going to be important for us to find water by the end of the year to keep the course as green as you're seeing it. And uh, so that's a big item. The well will be a major undertaking for the club. But the one good thing we do have the finances set aside for it, but uh, we still got a couple of more things to investigate as far as getting water from another source. Do I have any questions? Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's no dark area, does that mean it's going to stay the way it is now? Yes, it's, it's the dark water. areas are staying the way they are now. Oh, the dark areas. Yes, the there's not going to be any planting at this point, okay. this time. Okay. They'll be manicured and uh -huh. cut down and uh, taken care of, but there won't be no new planting right now. Okay. Question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that you hope to find a source of water by the end of this year? Yes. Uh, what's the prospectus there? Do you have uh, good chances? Or? Well, the well primarily is the last resort. And that's, we, we're pretty sure where we're going to drill the well is going to be on the, uh, the, the, I don't know if you're familiar with the three sets of keys that we have on each hole. Well, on the 17th hole, the furthest tee box in the back near, I guess it, Oak Leaf, uh, will be approximately where the drill, drill will be, where the well will be drilled. Have you done t test drilling to determine? We haven't done any test drilling. Uh, test drilling is not a cheap item. <laughs> but you need to have some kind of assurance. We have, a, we have a study that was done by the city of Santa Rosa that uh, covered 
a pretty thorough check on the fact that there is water there. So the aquifer there is adequate, you think? Yes, it is from the aquifer. Yes. I was thinking that uh, there had been an old well that was capped off, uh, perhaps behind uh, the RV storage area back down that direction, somewhere along the creek. Is, are you aware of that? Or yes, yes I am. And, and the productivity that you get from those wells, we have, we have uh, uh, documents showing how much water comes out of those particular wells. And it's very shallow. They're they're not very good. Uh, we're looking for 260 gallons a minute, and that requires about 10 inch pipe going down about 700 feet. So well, you nothing couldn't. we have here now is adequate. So it would make more sense to drill a new well than to try to uh, expand or do something with the old one. Is that right? Maybe that's not feasible. I don't know about wells. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm not an expert, but uh, I, I, I didn't quite get the question. Well, if there was an existing well that wasn't deep enough, would it yeah. sense to just go down further and perhaps save a bunch of costs? It's, it's really not, you know, just an interesting a question. Of interest to me. It really has nothing to do with the board business. Uh -huh. Well, we haven't we haven't looked into that particular type of situation. Uh, right now, we're looking at that report that the city did, which is about an inch and a half thick. And they put it, they did a very thorough check. And uh, the, I've gotten two pricing, two, uh, actually three prices for new wells. And all three people really are confident that there is water where we're thinking about building. What's Nobody the approximate is, cost of the that's that's some of the ways they tell that there is water there. What's the approximate cost of a new well? Range of costs. It's uh, actually you you gotta you gotta drill the holes, and that that's about seventy two thousand uh, dollars. That just gets you down to where you're seven hundred feet, and it doesn't guarantee any. Uh, no guarantees for the water, and then the pump is about forty thousand. So you're looking at about 120, 125,000 to do a well at 700 feet. That's a big risk. Yeah. Yeah, and there's no guarantees. <laughs> Thank you for your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Well, thank you. Yes. Um, are there any other sources for water besides drilling a well? Uh, yeah, we are looking into them. They're, with, with the way the situation is now with the county and the city having to do with this semi-drought type situation, it's very tough to talk to them. As a matter of fact, I've got a conference call this afternoon at 4.30 with the city and a person from the county. And we're going to talk about the possibility of buying water, maybe. Well, and that's just a possibility, but from from what I understand, the cost of water is not cheap. So that's just another thing we're looking at. Is is, uh, is the recycled water that most of being pumped up to the geysers now ever a source for you? I've never looked into that. I don't know. I can't answer that. I could find out about it through. I can answer. We have a good. I can answer that. Okay. There is uh, no way to pump the water back from the Yano Road uh, main sewage plant. That's the first thing we looked into four years ago when the city first announced they were going to close a sewer plant. They said it's one way only and would be impossible to to reverse it, so that's out of the question. Thanks, Wally. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any other question? Well, I'd like to thank you very much, and I'll try to keep you updated on what's going on at the club at your monthly meetings. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome.
item on our agenda is the normal members open forum. Now the mic is through, Frank is through with the uh, microphone. Step right up for your comments. Thank you. Uh, I'm Susan Millar, 373 Greenfield Circle. I am chair of the Oakmont Community Development Committee and I just wanted to bring up a couple of items here at the forum because we have a strange situation with our minutes. We have a meeting just before your meeting. You meet on Thursday. I never can get minutes to you in time. I've missed the deadline before we even have our meeting. Um, I just wanted to bring the board up to date and, well, whoever in the audience might be interested. Uh, the Elnoka project is uh, going along through the permitting process and design review. Uh, that's uh, quiet right now. Um, next July, uh, our next meeting in July, Mr. Ken Blackman from uh, the Meadow will be at our uh, OD, OCDC meeting to catch us up on uh, the Meadow and what uh, phase they're in. Uh, also, we are um, in possession now of the second application that Mr. Steve Ledson <clears throat> has made for his winery down on Highway 12. That is a very active situation. I'm still waiting for uh, the digital copies of this app, this free app, but I just want our uh, residents to know that the comment period is open now and um, I may be able to uh, later arrange to have something go out on the e-blast, but he is planning phase one right now, which will be two production barns, 12,000 square feet apiece, plus several other buildings, uh, which will total about 22,000 square feet. And the roof line is 42 feet high, and it consists of two large barns for production with a crush pad in between. The work that Steve Ledson has done there uh, thus far, which is taking out the walnut orchard, putting in a little bridge, and putting in a well, have not had to go through any kind of a review process uh, because he just, uh, converted ag to ag and I, we don't know about the well, but in any case, there has been no review of any of this. So now is the time to inform ourselves and make comments for the PRMD to hear from the uh, public. The OCDC, however, feels that the only and the strongest argument that, that we would have is the traffic situation. And I think that uh, it's time for us to address the county and Caltrans about what the heck they're gonna do with Highway 12. We've been talking about traffic problems, uh, Oakmont getting trapped in case of an emergency. There are three other wineries right across the street that have already been permitted for events. And uh, there's another huge project going in across from Steve Litson's place. That may not be a big traffic problem because I think it's going to be very expensive. So it may not be, you know, multitudes. <clears throat> right now, Steve Litson has on his phase one plan a couple of possible tasting rooms. Phase two will have a huge, huge tasting room if he gets to phase two. So I, I just want, I want you to know, I don't want this to slip by and have this comment period uh, go by without some kind of, um, uh, some kind of word from us, which I think should probably come from the board. So thank we, you, sir. Thank you. I'm Joan Steiger, I live on Oak Brook Lane. I'm here to thank, first of all, the board for um, all the work that you've put in and the time that you've expended to um, perhaps get the beauty shop for the OB-8 staff. Um, I'd like to talk about the drought and what's going on with Oakmont and the rules and regulations for all of us for our yards. 
It's come to my attention that Mrs. Pucci got a letter telling her that her artificial turf was in violation. And I understand the board is going to reconsider that or at least talk about it. In the 11 years I've known Mrs. Pucci, her yard has looked gorgeous, absolutely manicured. I cannot say that about many other yards in Oakmont. So I just really hope the board will reconsider her yard and allow her to keep her artificial turf. If you haven't looked at it, go look at it. Her yard is lovely. I bicycle through Oakmont almost every day, and I go on every street just about in Oakmont, and I can tell you there's a lot of other places that look terrible. Um, I want you to look at the Chronicle today, if you haven't, on page A9. There's a half a page photo of the Capitol building in California. The entire lawn is dead. They are observing the drought and cutting water to their lawn. I think that Oakmont needs to think about this seriously. Um, right now, only 15% of a yard is allowed to have rock, but there is a homeowner at 7601 Oakmont Drive who has nearly 100% rock in his or their front yard. I talked to him a while ago. He got permission from the Board and Architectural Committee to do that. So since he got approval, I really don't understand how anybody else can be told that they cannot have the same amount of rock in their yard. It makes sense with the drought as it is to allow things like that. I think the Board should just use common sense. Does the yard look appealing? Is it attractive? Or are there lots of dead weeds, air, dirt, um, dead shrubs, half dead trees? There's a lot of stuff overgrowing sidewalks. Nothing is done about it. So I'm just requesting that the board reconsider some of these regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I'm Carol Cotton, Pine Valley Drive. I have an observation and a suggestion. Not too long ago, our treasurer reported that we spent $98,000 on electricity uh, last year, and we're budgeting $105,000 for the coming year. And I'm just wondering if we could keep on and uh, keep enough lights on in our facilities to deter thefts, but not waste uh, electricity. Um, I walk every night around the west, and the women's locker room is usually all lit up, but there's nobody swimming or changing their clothes there. Uh, the Upper West is frequently lit, and nobody's been there since the afternoon uh, table tennis. And it used to be every morning when I came into the burger, it was all lit. And even right now, I think I just counted about 75 lights, and I don't know if we really need so much on the side when we're in the center park, and it's a nice sunny day. So um, with new management and new ma manager and new maintenance, I just wondered if we could have a cooperative effort between the resident users so that we turn off the lights or turn them down, dim them when we leave a facility, and then keep when maintenance comes in, keep in mind what time of year it is, how dark it is, whether we need full lights or much more reduced lights when they leave for the night. My name is Bridget Molinari. I live in Stonebridge Road. Uh, I just would like to address the board on something that has been going on the last two weeks here. Uh, some of us have two really bad weeks behind us. It was terrible. Uh, so I wonder, uh, when we move in here, people get uh, the bylaws, the CCNRs, and the rules and regulations, I hope. So uh, it is, of course, many people think they don't have to follow I wonder what can be done about that. We don't want to go so ever so often to fight people around here. So I wonder if we have new residence reception, if those people, instead of just welcoming them, that they get there, their words and regulation, and that somebody talks a little bit about it, that they have to be observed. Because we cannot go on like that, that people think they're just here 
for other people, just for the older crowd, how they call us now. Actually, uh, some a little bit worse than that, but it's not going to go on like that because it has opened the power. So I, I hope you think about that a little bit because it's not going to work like this anymore. We don't want to go through the rest of our lives to have to fight people that move in here that don't like to obey the laws. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Any other open forum comments before we proceed with the agenda? As usual open forum comments. Give the manager and the board plenty to think about. Thank you. Let's see how my system went to sleep. The next item on the agenda is uh, listed as announcements and residents report. I have no announcements today. Are there any other members of the board who have announcements that they would like to make? Seeing none, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, the executive meeting minutes. And in the absence of our secretary, I'll report that on our May 20th executive session, the board dealt with discussion about our facilities condition as a reflection of the visits that we made together to check out these facilities and to broaden our understanding of the costs that would be involved in addressing a long list of uh, maintenance items and a, and a need to schedule them to fit in with our ability to manage that kind of uh, activity. And our session on June the 3rd uh, dealt with the West Recreation Center design contract and building permit uh, status for work that is being uh, planned to upgrade that building. We also had design contact negotiations for the feasibility of the Burger Beauty Parlor remodel and lot split, and the reflection of some of those discussions is an item later on today's agenda. And thirdly, we had discussion of alternatives to the Burger Beauty Parlor building that's now in our feasibility work. We had no actions taken outside the board meeting this past month. So item seven on our agenda is the uh, consent calendar. May I have a motion to adopt the uh, consent calendar? Mm -hmm. Moved by John Felton, seconded by Herman Hess. Any discussion? All in favor of adopting the consent calendar? Thank you. I guess I should use the word approve rather than adopt. Thank you. Item eight on the agenda is our treasurer's report. Chuck, can you please? For the month of May, we had revenue of $178,000, which was 3% better than budget, and expenses of $157,000, which was 9% better than budget, leaving us a surplus of almost $21,000. On a year-to-date basis, the revenue was $853,000, which was 1% worse than budget, with expenses of $798,000, or 7% better than budget, leaving us a surplus here today of almost $55,000. The transfers to the funds were all the same as budget. Uh, there have been six homes sold in the, or sold in the orchard uh, with six left to sell. And cash in the various funds, operating funds, 634,000, asset replacement, 805,000, capital improvement, 1,434, catastrophe, 105,000, with total cash balance of two million nine seventy eight. Any questions from the board? No questions, but I'd like to comment for those of you that are looking at this as an attachment to your agenda. You notice particularly perhaps that the asset replacement fund is down over two hundred thousand dollars from last month's report. And that reflects the kind of money that we spend when we do major projects like the uh, Burger Plaza construction activity. Have to be paid. And fortunately, we managed in a way that we have that kind of resource available in the, uh, in the accounts. Can I have the board accept the report? Motion to accept the chair's report. Moved by Alan Altman, seconded by Bob Giddings. Thank you. Move to accept the report. I mean, vote to accept the report. Alan Scott. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Ah. 
trying to watch a board, a piece of paper, and my tongue going. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon me. The next item on the agenda is the manager's report. Cassie, you please? Uh, for those of you who still don't know, uh, the communications committee suggested that I send uh, a weekly email as kind of a what's happening manager's update. I kind of uh, was for it and against it because it was something else I had to do. And so Harriet Hall graciously stepped forward and uh, volunteered to write, so now it's a collaboration. Uh, regarding I pick up the week's events that I think everyone would, might be interested in and then Harriet sends me, uh, creates it and sends it back to me and, and I revise it a little and then it gets sent out to everyone and it seems like it's been uh, received very positively so we'll continue to do this. Thank you for your comments. The other uh, thing that I noticed that's not in my manager's report. The written one is, I kind of scroll through the next door blog, and I don't know how this started, but it, it seems to be that there's this feeling that the association dues are gonna go up because we're gonna help subsidize the golf course. I don't know how things like this ever even get going, but they did, so I'm here to tell you today that's not on the agenda. But something else will come up. So the, the other thing, uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is there was a, a, a comment made by a realtor in a newsletter that I think is uh, worth reviewing because this ties into what the architectural committee is going to be doing. Marianne Newfield isn't here today. She is? Yeah. Marianne, would you like to talk about what you're going to be doing today? <laughs> Sorry. Well, you probably can explain it just as well as I, but the Architectural Committee will be doing property inspections. We're not, we're not policemen, but we will be doing property inspections. And we're going to put an article in the paper in July, 15th, I guess, will be coming in. So we'll run it for a month until August 15th so that everybody will understand what we're looking for. And um, so that is going to happen. I want to stay up here because I think I'm up next. <laughs> the other, uh, as an adjunct to that, I'd, I'd like to uh, talk about this newsletter that went out to all the homeowners and a quote was, Many of our buyers who plan to reside here are not interested in renovating and therefore properties that are in need languish on the market. Landscaping is another priority in selling a home. Many of the maintained areas are in serious need of landscape updating and or care and that will draw property values down considerably. Owners in the HOAs should take a look around and get involved in bringing the standard of care up if that is warranted. And then after uh, another email, this person said, I'm aware of some of the associations just removing old bushes and frozen bushes with no plan to replant. Somehow the directors of these associations need to be reminded of their responsibilities to the OVA as well as to the owners they are serving. Their jobs are not simply to keep the cost dues down their jobs are to maintain the common areas of their respective HOAs. Are the HOAs not subject to the same rules and laws regarding replacement budgets? In keeping costs down, they are dramatically lowering their property values. Isn't this doing a disservice to the other owners, particularly some elderly people who reside in maintained areas because they are no longer able to take care of their exteriors? The next thing, the next item on my list is I'd like to discuss a little bit more about Panasonic coming to Oakmont and doing a uh, survey. 
they have about half the amount of people that they need uh, to volunteer. And what they're going to be doing is they're, they're going to be uh, asking people to do a research survey with them that has to do with uh, using an iPad or some kind of pad. And it's about communicating with others as in um, FaceTime. And they're trying to develop a piece of equipment that will be easier for people who are possibly computer challenged. And so in order to be able to do that, they have to do this research. And they're offering a $25 gift certificate for anyone who's willing to come in and, and talk to them. And uh, they will probably be here at the CAC either this Thursday or Friday, if not enough people to sign up, so that they can try and get more people. Their requirement is a minimum of 25 people for the interview. So if you see one or two people in the CAC on Thursday or Friday, uh, just kind of hanging out in the, the lobby, that's, that's what they're going to be doing. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. I have a comment. Please. Uh, I want to express thanks to Kathy and her efforts to get us all the iPads. Uh, in a couple of days, learning curve will start to flatten, I hope. Uh, I find it much more user-friendly than uh, Microsoft. And do you have any ideas what this will save us in regard to printing costs and paper? Millions. <laughs> <laughs> Not off the top of my head. <laughs> Before we leave the manager's report, I'd like to uh, just make an observation about one portion of, of Cassie's report regarding the West Recreation Center updates that are being planned. It's really a major undertaking as far as that building is concerned. It is still in the building permit and design approval process, but very close, hopefully by Thursday of this week, to get the approvals that we need. So going ahead with that project, is the point I want to make, is going to really, under the construction time frame, cause a disruption of activities that take place at the West Recreation Center. So if we start construction in September, and we put a framework around the exterior of that building to do all the removal and, and reapplication and, and structural corrections that are necessary. It's undoubtedly going to change the lives of those that are participating in activities in, in that location for a couple of months. And uh, we'll be looking forward as we know more specifically about the construction schedule to any input that any of you may have about how we minimize the impact. People are going to have to adjust their swimming schedules and their, maybe even their tennis schedules and, and all sorts of activity uh, surrounding that West Rec Center project as it goes on for uh, two or three months in order to accomplish our objectives of making it a longer lasting building. The next uh, item on the agenda has to do with architectural committee items. At the last uh, month's board meeting, the architectural committee introduced us to their first efforts to talk about expanding the use of artificial turf. And uh, this week, uh, they're going to tell us about an exception that they uh, added to their guidelines. Well, it's uh, pretty simple. We just added the wording of right in the first line, exception on golf course properties. Let's see. Exception, artificial turf may be allowed on properties adjacent to the golf course, surrounded by plants or a three foot high fence. Thank you. Uh, yes. Marianne, I just had a quick question because you know writing these are, are difficult it's a question not a suggestion would a reference at that point to the setback uh, be appropriate on that uh, 
that exception you made? Should it be added? That refer to setback sections? The 25 foot setback? Yeah. Um, the fence, yes. Plantings can be done within that 25 foot setback. I'm referring to uh, artificial grass and it being hidden by shrubs or a three foot high fence. Then yes, you're right. It would be um, af within after the 25 foot setback. Yeah. I'm just really not. I'm just asking. Would it be helpful to refer the person reading this to that setback section? Yes, I think you're right. Bob, well, thank you. I think there perhaps is a point that we need to reiterate periodically about the work of the Architectural Committee. These kinds of items come to the board as an advisory from the Architectural Committee. And we can take action to publicize them, to offer observations about modifications to them, but we do not have approval. The CCNRs give the authority for setting these kinds of guidelines for architectural controls, purely in the hands of the architectural committee. And so as we go on to talk about the uh, next item, uh, which has to do with architectural controls, I think it's always good to remember that this committee is operating in the best interest of our community but independent of uh, approval of what they come up with from the uh, board of directors. And John, I would add too that we appreciate your comment from the board. <laughs> if there are no further comments about the, the, uh, the artificial turf, would you go on to the next item, please? Well, it's the ad hoc committee uh, for AC violations, of what we submitted. Um, I guess that's for you to discuss if you want to send it on to the attorney or um, Betty. Yes, thank you. At our workshop uh, two weeks ago, uh, Marianne and members of the Architectural Committee presented us their report on uh, architectural violations penalties. And it now comes to the board for action because this is not an architectural guideline it has to do with the administrative aspects. It comes to the board to address issues of writing what an enforcement policy may be. Who does it? How are appeals handled? Is there a needed introductory or amnesty period? And uh, so I invite the members of the board to offer their thoughts on what you believe our next step as, as a board should be in terms of uh, carrying out the recommendations that the ad hoc committee on, on architectural violation penalties came up with. That's in the you had two weeks to think about it. <laughs> Absolutely. John, I, I always pride myself in stating the obvious, and uh, it is obvious the amount of work that's gone into this. And uh, I would like, I'm not sure, as if this is the proper uh, procedure, either a workshop of ourselves or executive session, whichever it is, but uh, I think we need to think together and, uh, and individually on this and get together as a board to give our comments, our, our best comments, our best effort for Marianne and the architectural thing. So I would, say let's put this an agenda item on something some meeting very soon where we can discuss it as a group and prepare for that any other comments on how we ought to approach an action activity john i would agree with bob i would support bob's comment about us getting together and openly discuss it Is there any reason, uh, Cassie, from your point of view, to develop any further documentation on the practice of uh, penalties and appeal processes and so forth prior to having that discussion? Yes, I think it's in 
and the best interest of everybody to uh, get this recommendation uh, in, a, in a legal framework uh, redeveloped by a, a uh, perhaps uh, Sandra Gottlieb because she was, um, she was the first one we addressed the fines to and maybe to return this and say, okay, now Sandra put it in the uh, legal form so this becomes something that we can actually uh, work off of. I would say doing this sooner than later uh, because we have about 55 uh, outstanding, at least 55 outstanding landscape violations at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we get some kind of fine penalty in place, I believe the faster we'll get compliance. If that's the way you're going to go. So, so you would advise getting some legal input before we have the discussion? So you can have two weeks to get legal input before we discuss it? Sure. <laughs> but uh, maybe that would be a waste of expense if uh, you might want to take a straw poll of the board right now to see if they're interested in even having fines in place. If they're not, why, why bother? Why spend the money? Uh, I'd like to make a comment that goes along with the fine policy. Um, irrespective of what we decide on the fines, if, if, well, I should say, if we go forward with fines, I think there's an awful lot of other work that needs to be done by the architectural committee and the community in conjunction with implementing fines. I, I just Looking out into seeing how a fine policy would work, the current process, I just I don't see a smooth implementation of this without looking at other things. And I agree with Cassie. We should get it vetted first to see not only what if the fine policy works, but also what other considerations as far as due process is concerned that we need to create to make sure that we're we're going to be okay. All the way. it's not just fines. We have to make sure we're, we're putting the things in the right place. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, I guess the question is who would implement, the, who would levy the fines? In the current process today, the board would do that. My proposal, or what I would be looking at, is, is to change where all this happens. Any uh, audience comments? I saw Herm reaching for his microphone, which he doesn't have as readily available as he used to. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Herm Herman, uh, Oak Leaf Circle. I'm seriously concerned about the implementation of this policy. I strongly, I was on the architecture committee for five years before I was on the board. I strongly believe that something like this fine policy is needed, but I think the implemented, implementation of it is going to take a lot of study and a lot of care because to just go out and start inspecting every property and having a hard and fast rule that you got to do this because this is the guideline, you got to do this because this is the standard. It, you, there's going to have to be some flexibility in this and this is going to be the most difficult thing that, that, we, that the architecture committee is, is going to have to face. They can't just enforce everything exactly the same way throughout the community. There has to be flexibility. And I'm, I'm, I, this, I agree with Andy that it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of thought. And I just hope that you don't, while I agree that with Cassie probably we do need to get it moving, but don't rush into it so fast that you lose sight of the problems of the implementation and the study it's going to take to implement this properly. Thank you. Perfect. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, last month when Marianne presented these thoughts to us, uh, she was very open. And one of my thoughts at that time was that of the, of the uh, associations that have fines now that we look at. None of them didn't have fines before. So it's that transition which you're pointing out that I think is crucial too, that we really have, you want to get this right the first time. You know, you don't want to have to go back. Uh, 
So I, I, I take your point very strongly. It's great. I also think that uh, you have to start somewhere. And trust me, because I've, I've seen a million hearings, I'm going to use million a lot today, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of gray areas. So let's take the 15% gravel rule. You think somebody's actually going to get out there with a tape measure and say, no, I think this is 17% and these oh, yeah. people should get a letter. <laughs> I mean, I don't think the architectural committee, that's not their intent to enforce that kind of strictness in, in the policies. But no matter how much you prepare for something like this, it isn't all black and white. And it will have to be enforced uniformly. One of the questions that keeps coming up is, what if people are asked to keep clean up their property and they can't afford it? Or they're confirmed and they can't do it? Those kind of questions we can also talk about in, in a session, about what to do with people like that, because I'm sure the board isn't interested in this. The architectural committee isn't interested in uh, forcing someone who doesn't have the means or isn't uh, up to it uh, health-wise to comply. But there are other ways to do it. Perhaps a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor committee could be formed to clean up someone's property who isn't able to do that. So. Uh, as situations arise, because you're not going to be able to get your arms around every single issue uh, that comes up, my suggestion is um, not, not to try and, and get A to Z every possibility uh, have an answer for, because this is going to be a, an evolution here. I think the last two speakers addressed my concerns, which all goes to the point that I was going to make that we need more time to talk about it. Um, uh, the anecdote I was going to say was we just sold, sold a house of a lady who had been in a wheelchair for 10 years, was living alone, and was 94 years old. And there just has to be. She was she was at the mercy of Mo and Blow guys, and Mo and Blow guys dominate the the gardening in in Oakmont, and that's something we have to take into account. Sure. Mary, I would like to make a comment about the fines. The one that's really important to the architectural committee is the no application fine. Um, if we don't have anything else, quite frankly, if we had the no application fine, it would solve about 80% of the issues. Thank you. Yes, I think that was really clear in your report. Thank you. It's an important point. I'm speaking from a particular point of view because I happen to have moved into Oakmont into a neighborhood in which my next door neighbor, I found out later, was nicknamed the Colonel. Obvious reasons. I think I had two or three violations before I even moved in. Fortunately, I called the architect of the OVA office and they said, we're so glad you called. That's all in I mean, I didn't mean to be doing anything. Uh, and by the way, the colonel kept coloneling. I think until finally they were, uh, you know, just appalled at each time she called. You know, including calling down to my car being parked in front of my own house, but close to her lot line, and she objected because of the sight line from her window. So. I'm a little concerned about going into draconian fines when we do have a lot of people in the community that are like that. It seems like when you talk to groups, there's one in every neighborhood, at least one. 
So I'm a little concerned about what may be a little draconian, and I certainly want the board to consider that. Um, and, and whatever happened to the idea that going next door or across the street and talking to someone about it? I mean, just as a neighbor, to say, hey, do you know, you know, would you like, can't you clean this up or whatever it may be? Because a lot of people have hidden behind the board and make every comment and every complaint to them and then our volunteers, of which, by the way, were by and large very nice, very polite, very understanding and willing to work with you. Uh, but they've hidden behind them and created the work for them instead of just going next door and say, hey, you know, can't, how about this dead bush? Or you intend to take that out or whatever? That, you know, because I, I think that by and large, we are very, very fortunate to have the number of really workers that we have had in this association for so long. And I think the whole community is a tribute to them. So I don't know that I want to replace that with money fines that quickly and that bigly. I gather the consensus uh, board is to talk about it more, but I think Cassie had an important uh, question to raise. And that is, that we have a straw vote perspective on whether or not the board supports the concept of developing penalties for uh, architectural violations. There's been a lot of emphasis on dollars, but violation penalties don't have to be purely dollars. There are facilities use uh, restrictions as uh, another example. Zonings uh, so, taking away people's zoning rights? So there are, there are a number of them. But we do as a community have the distinction of being the lone wolf so far as uh, penalties are concerned for anything. And uh, so I guess I would, would ask for a show of hands. Is there a strong majority support? John, before we do that, can I ask this? Are those 55 situations you speak of, Cassie, are they clear violations where the people fail to uh, get an application? Or are these the kinds of things? Are these the kinds of things that uh, might be subjective? These particular violations, you'd have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to notice walking past a house. So these are kind of the violations are that somebody has half the roof covered with plastic. These are the kind of violations that five of the bushes on the front or the side of their house are absolutely dead and there's no possibility of them coming back. Violations like uh, an absolutely 100% dead lawn. Those are the kind of violations we're talking about. We're not talking about violations that are great. Strava is, is the John, I, I'd like to throw this out. I, I would not like a straw vote. I, I take very seriously what the committee has worked on. And I, I, I don't want to indicate that I don't like fines or I don't like fines. I want to study the matter with you folks. And, and, uh, and it, it doesn't help. I realize the process, the progress on it, but uh, I'm not prepared to raise my hand one way or the other. I just to throw that in. I'd like to make a motion uh, that we table this, this further discussion for now and, and direct our, our manager uh, to contact our, our legal people and we try to put this into a little bit of a, a more uh, uh, defined form as far as the fines and how that would work um, and then take that back and have a, a discussion later uh, considering everything that's been said here today it's a complex issue and we want to do it right the first time and uh, I think there's not a hurry to get this into place uh, despite some of these situations we have now I think as a point of order, John, there's no motion to be
tabled. And so we can do what we want to do as far as the, the item is concerned. No, I can table this. I don't believe so. Fran is our parliamentarian. I just supported her. <laughs> Did you have something you wanted to add to the conversation? No, I uh, So I gather that we can, uh, that we have a sense that we want to talk about this some more. Yes. Point of order. I'd like Fran's opinion based on her many years of experience in, uh, in government is whether or not what I propose is, is legitimate to ask. Hey, John, may I think? He asked you a question. <laughs> I, uh, I, I totally agree that uh, this uh, subject can be tabled. You don't need a motion to table. You can table the discussion until a later date. And we're proposing to discuss this at a later date. I'm not sure that I understand what we want, to, what you want to do, John. So, John, if you, you want, if you want to make a motion that the attorney be hired to look at, review, and uh, create a, a rule format, you, I believe you could do that. If that's what you're thinking, I don't know what you. That's my intent. That's where I want to get to. I just decide how to get to it. I'll be happy. The motion is to hire, to get legal advice on drawing up fine policy statement. Is that? And procedures. Right. Beginning to end. So we have a motion to get legal counsel to prepare a fines policy and procedure document for us to discuss at a future workshop setting. Yes. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, that. And against? Abstentions, I guess. Two, two abstentions. What would you propose to do in addition, Andy? Well, I'm a little. Um, I'm not thinking back on the legal issue right now. I'm not sure we're prepared to even get the legal opinion because I don't think we know exactly what procedures are we want to put in place. You don't have a choice. Some of those are. No, well, I understand. There's due process and okay. certain notifications and publications and stuff. Those procedures I understand. I'm I'm worried. That's not the implementation I'm worried about. I know we know how to follow, how to publish things, and dates and stuff like that. I'm worried about more the process that the architectural committee goes through. If we're putting something in here. I don't know how. Like we have we we mess up when we do handoffs now between the architectural committee and the board and vice versa, just because there's business going back and forth that's not known by everybody at the same time. And I'm concerned we're adding a level of complexity without looking into everything that gets to that point. It's hard, to, it's hard for me to explain because I'm, I'm sitting inside of the process and it's hard for me to jump out of it to explain it. But we're, we're gonna end up, with they start doing inspections, the AC starts doing inspections, you can conceivably, and I'm giving examples, please don't jump on these numbers, they can come up with 300 complaints of which they have to act on. 50 people fix them up, 250 people don't, and then all of a sudden they've got 250, or somebody's got 250 fines to start levying and then hearings to start listening to for appeals, and I think we need to fix things downstream before we get to that point. What would be a specific that needs to be fixed down here? I can name a lot of things, and I'll just name a few off the top. Um, to remove a lot of the, the subjectivity from the guidelines and standards is one. Remove some of the enforcement. Architectural committee today is responsible for compliance and, and generating and creating guidelines and standards. Move enforcement to the architectural committee. Take it away from the board. Let the board be the final part of due process where we as a body would then be 
looking at the fine that's levied, not the violation. Let them determine the violation and let us look at whether we're being fair and equitable with levying the fine itself. Things like that. There's probably, I can have 20 more things. I didn't think this was the place to bring those up, but there's a lot of parts of the process that we can look at that we do today that we can change, streamline, and simplify. That's all I'm saying. In that line of thinking, is there, is there any reason whether we had a fine policy or not that these things that you talk about in terms of the guidelines shouldn't be worked on anyway? No, those should be worked on as well. What I'm saying is those should be worked on concurrently with anything else, but if you're going to do a fine policy, I'm, I would think that some of those things should... It's One can be done without the other, but the other shouldn't be done. Does that make sense? Then do the members of the board want to have some further discussion of this subject at a workshop while the legal work is being done? Do we need to really flesh out some of these other things that you're talking about? Make sure they get on track. Well, the board just voted the majority to, to do get the legal advice. And it wasn't a motion, it was a suggestion, a question, a plea. Let's get together as soon as we can and go through this and give it our serious attention as a group, not as individuals, but as a group. Uh, to get into this as far as we can so we understand Marianne better, the committee better, and we understand Andy better. You know, sure. there's a lot of work and experience behind this, and I do not pretend to know all the ramifications of any changes. Uh, John? Yes. I, I personally would feel much more comfortable if we had the advice of the legal authority because I do think a lot of these things could end up being involved with litigation and I'd rather have the legal opinion first off than rather go after it. That's a good point. That's an interesting comment, Herm, because one of the one of the reasons behind doing this was to avoid litigation. My, my intent, or what I'm trying to go with this, is that the legal portion would just be another input to help us uh, come up with the best solution. And not to adopt what they said as gospel and to apply it in a case where it may not work yep. for us. Uh, I, I, we definitely need to sit down as a group and discuss all the implications. And that's just one of the pieces that we're going to need uh, eventually uh, to, to do that. So the question really is uh, two, two different ways of looking at it. We take the, the legal input and make that part of our uh, guideline is we decide what to do or do we decide what to do and then submit it for legal evaluation and tweak it to make it match at that end I just i felt that we're going to have to do it eventually is to just get the legal input and definitely sit down and discuss all the implications here that are other uh, concerns that we share that's where i'd like to see it go let, that was my intent let me let me do some clarification about the framework there are certain things that in order to hold hearings and to be able to level fines that you must do. But what is open, to, so in that framework, that's what the attorney can work on. But the things that are open for discussion is, for example, how much the fines are. Can the fines be daily, weekly, monthly? Uh, Another interpretation is how many notices do you give people? Some associations give a person one notice and 30 days to clear up the, the violation. And then the second notice, if they don't do it, it goes to a hearing right away. Other associations have a protocol where uh, someone calls first and tries to talk to the person. Then the next letter is an actual letter with the date in mind and then there's a final violation, and then there's a hearing. I mean, there's, there's ways to do this, but if, if you determine what you want, and then I take, and you do all of this work and spend hours at this, and then I turn it over to somebody like Attorney Gottlieb, and she says, you can't do any of it. So to me, um, if she gives you a framework 
within which to operate, then you're going to know the parameters of the things you can change and the things you can't. And I'd like to get an opinion from her about uh, the architectural committee being able to go through the hearings and through the fines. If that's if that's where you're headed, I'd like to make sure that that's that's legal for OPA to do. And, and I think the other thing that's important is that this is not an executive session kind of conversation that we need to have. The community needs to hear all that we're puzzling with. And so uh, I, would, I would propose that we not try to squeeze in a particular uh, get-together sessions, but stay with our regular schedule of either conversations in these monthly board meetings or conversations in our in our workshop sessions. Mm -hmm. That way the community, as we try to move ahead with this or try to understand this better, would, uh, would understand that that's where the conversations are going to take place, not in some kind of uh, closed committee uh, or executive session. You've had some standing in line. Would you like to add to our puzzle? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for... Uh Speak. I, I am well known to the architectural committee, but they have never met me. I have received three letters this year, totaling of about seven hundred dollars in fines. If you had them, excuse me. Louise Leck, seven zero one three, Fairfield Drive. Just pick the microphone up and hold it. It can work better for you. Okay. So uh, we have probably uh, run up about seven hundred dollars in fines this year. Um, I, too, like a previous speaker, would have welcomed a phone call from Oakmont because um, we were in process of having our front yard redesigned by the designer. And it's now been done, so we won't give you more letters. Um, and I support your um, action to keep Oakmont beautiful. Um, but I have serious question about process. When we submitted our drawings from the designer, they were rejected because they were the wrong size. Our neighbor walked in with a hand drawing and it was accepted. So I have, again, serious question about process, okay? I don't mind having rules, I just want it to be fair. And, um, and I'll try to talk to the architectural committee in the future. You know what? Thank you. Thank you. True. <laughs> Betty Seaport, Stone Bridge, and uh, or Stone Creek Circle Homeowners Association. And I just, I don't know about the rest of Oakmont, but our house, I don't have a, I don't have a south side, but I have a north, I, ha I don't have an east, I have a north, south, and west side, and I hate it too, and I have since the day I moved in, but it is solid rock underneath. And I don't know what I would do. I, uh, first I had ivy and ants. I got rid of the ivy and the ants, and I tried to plant, and there was no way I could get one inch down there. It was just so many rock. And uh, the best I could do was put uh, sand, uh, uh, a topsoil, on top of what was there and then just put a bare root. So when it comes to, I think we all should, you should take that into consideration. What are we gonna do? And maybe for those that are so rocky, have a suggestion and help us find a gardener that will work with it. But I, I had, I was maybe 60 when I moved in here. <laughs> and uh, I was energetic and I was gonna dig down and plant and have a nice garden. but. I gave up, and I don't think I'm the only one. Thank you. The gentleman behind you will take it. Thank you for your comment. I'm David Lynch, 176 Mountain Vista Place. Been here 10 years. Uh, first of all, I would like to applaud the homeowners here in Oakmont for making an effort to make their homes look nice. And I think it's sad that the architectural committee would go around getting after anybody that makes an effort to make their home plans. I drive three times a week from home to the center here to the gym. I can count a hundred homes that need help 
not 55 violations. My cul-de-sac alone is 13 houses. We can't Sorry? My cul-de-sac has 13 houses on it. Two of those gardens are in the front. The entire thing are rock. My next door neighbor, the entire property is rock. I don't know whether they ever got approval for anything or not. Uh, there was a comment in the paper a couple of weeks ago about beginning to use too much tan bark. What's with this center strip all the way down from Highway 12 right here to White Oak? That's all tan bark. What with this strip right up the street here? That's all bordered in tan bark. What the hell's going on? It will help if you keep your microphone. All right, sorry. We can like to hear what you let's, have to say. Let's encourage people and applaud them for making that. Why do they have to have approval to change their windows? They're improving their home. I can, hear, I can agree if they are putting plastic on their roof and it's being ignored. If they're trying to replace their roof, they're improving their home. We're all benefiting from improvements. Why do we make this thing? If you want to paint your purple, your house purple, I agree. Stop it. But if you're trying to improve your home, encourage people to do it. Don't create all this damn mess to discourage it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that we're going to be talking about this item much more in our agendas. Is there something further that we is essential for today? Turn into an architectural meeting. <laughs> yeah. I'm the culprit who has the turf. 6369 Stonebridge Road, Teresa Pucci. I would like to understand why I cannot put turf if I were given a reason for it. I have researched it thoroughly, I have found the right green product to use. I put it in and I've been told to rip it off. At least a reason I think should be given when somebody opposes or somebody says that this is not possible to be done or that you shouldn't be doing it. What is the reason for it? Turf is perfectly okay. It has been okay by the state of California. There's 125 pages worth on the uh, on the internet. I have three pages because I didn't read the whole 125, but it is okay and it has been approved. Now, I have spent a lot of money. I think that Oakland would be very well served if there were enough people like me who wanted to spend as much as I did to put this little piece of turf on my lawn. Instead, I don't use any more water on it. It looks beautiful. It is very easy to maintain with some just powders that you put on there for weeds not to grow, maybe once a year, twice a year. It makes sense, but you will never find anybody else who wants to spend as much as I did on it. But that I should be penalized and those who rip it off really kind of hurt. There is to it. The uh, artificial turf ban has been in the guidelines for years, uh, way before I came on the AC. Do we want to go on to the next one, Don? I or are you so. done with? <laughs> you know, this is a subject that's going to come up again, and obviously questions about whether or not times have changed and artificial turf approaches have changed will continue to be a subject of discussion, but I think we've done all that we can today. Thank you. The next item on the agenda has to do with drought conditions. And would you go ahead with that, please, Mary? We prepared uh, a landscape criteria for drought conditions. This will be published in the July 1st and July 15th paper. Here of lawns, I'll just go over this uh, briefly. Here of lawns, we expect people to, to still take care of their lawns. Uh, they must be mowed, trimmed, and weed free. Uh, we recommend that water can be reduced by 20% and still keep it uh, fairly green. Uh, there is a website uh, referenced for lawn watering suggestions and information. 
landscape for front yards and properties adjacent to the golf course, front yard landscaping and landscaping in public view, and golf course boundaries must be landscaped with live plant material. We did add bark or mulch cannot exceed 50% of landscaping without approval of the AC. Now that doesn't mean that you cannot have it, it's just that we would like to see the design and if it works with the design, it's quite, quite all right. <coughs> that goes for the 15% too. Um, if you have a design that works and it's nice and for those uh, yards that are just full of rock, they were not uh, approved if they come to the AC. Uh, if anybody files a uh, complaint on those properties and we see that it has been approved, then it is approved. We don't make them change it. Once the AC makes an approval, it stands. So the drought tolerant, uh, the resisting, sorry, drought resistant landscaping must be maintained at all times. And that means that the perennials and the ornamental grasses need to be cut back cut the dead part off um, to remove the dead material. All landscaping and public view must be kept weed free. Any sick or dying plants must be removed and replaced and no plants that may encroach over the public sidewalks. Application for approval, we would like everyone to first file an application before you remove your lawn and let us know what you're going to landscape it with. A drawing of a landscape plan must be submitted along with your application. And an architect's drawing is not necessary. You can put in a hand uh, written sketch. And we must approve the application before you get started. We don't like to come out and see that the job is already done with purple rock or whatever it is and then we have to deal with that. We normally work within a 10 day working period. You'll get your application back. But if you don't, please let us know and we'll get to it right away and get it back to you. On those, uh, I do want to mention one thing, the perennials and ornamental grasses, when they start to, when they die back, poppies is one thing. When they start to die, you can take them out, remove them and also remove the weeds that are long growing in with the poppies. Spanish lavender is another one. It can be cut back after it's bloomed. The, dead, the longer you leave that dead stuff on there, the plants will become very woody and it's hard to bring them back. So go ahead and cut them back. Any questions? Comments or questions? The next item on the agenda is the uh, renewal of the uh, circulator bus contract with the City of Santa Rosa. They have more work to do and more information to gather before they put it in front of the board. Oakmont Lawn Bowling had a thought that they wanted to bring forward a request in connection with a public tournament in 2015. They asked us to withdraw it from discussion. So pardon me for skipping over to the circulator bus contract. This is the annual renewal of our long-standing contract for bus service and it reflects the kind of increase that's being reflected in other bus service activities in uh, Santa Rosa. Do I have a motion to approve the uh, renewal of the contract? Moved by Bob, seconded by Andy. Your question. Now, I, I may be confused on this, but it seems to me they just cut back on our service. Is that not correct? That's not on our correct. service hours? What they did was cut back on the paratransit service. Okay. And the paratransit service was required by uh, whatever regulations govern that federally to match the 
the scheduled bus service for the area that the scheduled bus is operating. Thank you for clarifying that. I was just concerned that they cut our service back and increased the cost. And that would make us a little unhappy. It certainly would. Other questions or discussion? All in favor? Thank you. The uh, next item has to do with ratifying the renewal of the employee benefits contract. For those in the audience that may not be aware of the process, OBA relies, relies on a broker to go into the marketplace and find the providers that will uh, make available in our benefit package the scope of benefits that our employees enjoy. So that not only in this particular situation includes a health plan with Kaiser, a dental plan with the Guardian Company, a vision plan with the Guardian Company, a long-term disability plan with the Guardian Company, and a uh, life insurance and uh, disability benefits uh, element also with the uh, Guardian Company. The plan last year cost us $76,596, and the renewal price is $76,645. We have a motion to uh, ratify the uh, renewal of uh, our employee benefits brokered with the Advanced Benefit Group. So moved. Moved by Allen, seconded by Perm. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? <coughs> the item G is ratifying the item we discussed at our workshop, which was the addition of new pool and patio furniture at the East Recreation Center in the amount of $11,500. Do I have a motion to ratify that purchase? Moved by Allen, second by Andy. Discussion? All in favor? Item H is to ratify the discussion we had at the workshop about new picnic tables at the West Recreation Center picnic area and at the Bocce courts in the amount of $8,500. Do I have a motion to ratify that? I did. Moved by Herm S. Seconded by John Felton. Discussion? All in favor? The final ratification is for the uh, fitness center replacing uh, two uh, treadmills and uh, interlocking stretch mats for a uh, total of eight thousand, pardon me, six thousand. John, you have the numbers uh, reversed. The uh, the picnic tables were uh, six thousand dollars. And oh, the treadmills are 85. Yes. I beg your pardon. It would be better if I learned how to read or got the right page. Can you correct the minutes for it, please, Kathy? <laughs> we, we, we approved the uh, picnic tables, but the amount was $6,000 rather than the 8500 now may I have a motion for the treadmills and, uh, and the uh, exercise mats. Moved by Alan Scott, second by Herm S. And the total casting is $9,500? Yes. All in favor? Thank you. They'll be here by the end of June. And will they be colorful like the page in my book? <laughs> Hopeful. The, and item J has to do with architectural contract for feasibility analysis of remodeling and redesigning the uh, Burger uh, Beauty Salon building as part of our due diligence to see if we should go ahead with that purchase. The board has had 
contract uh, interviews and discussions with uh, three firms. We reduced that to two uh, proposals. Uh, we have a proposal from Weir Anderson and Associates for $3,500 to do the feasibility study. And we have a proposal for a phase one feasibility study from Archelogics for $6,500 have a motion expressing someone's interest in how we should proceed on this. John. I move that uh, of the two we select we're Anderson as uh, to do the work specified. Seconded. Moved and seconded John Felton and Herm Hess. The project description for those of you in the audience that they'll be doing for $3,500 is to Explore the remodel of an existing one-story, approximately 2,400 square foot retail building into administrative offices. The project will entail refiguring, reconfiguring of the inter interior partitions, interior lighting, and interior finishes. Exterior work will include new windows and trim, exterior lighting, entry structure, and cladding details. These are not final design decisions are an expression of their research into what it would cost and whether it's feasible within the budget that we have uh, proposed. What? All in favor? And all opposed? Two opposed. Done. Uh, what we're trying to do what we're trying to do is get a picture of what it would cost to develop a beauty salon within the 120 days. And I believe that comes up sometime in mid-August. Yes. Thank you. The, uh, the next item on our agenda is for the board to establish a date for its goal setting. We had discussed earlier that we wanted it to follow our, at some point, our July 1st workshop, at which time we do some further discussing, discussion, have further discussions of our priorities regarding the building facilities that we've been taking a look at over the past couple of months. And so we were all asked to bring our calendars to talk about a possible date. Tuesday, the 1st of August, is our workshop. 1st of July, thank you. Uh, yeah. Would you want to meet uh, a week later to have our goal setting session on Tuesday, the 8th of uh, July? Or would you like to meet sooner? Do you have any other suggestions? At 10 o'clock, the, the mention on our present calendar, um, it says board agenda, but if you open that, uh, that's the deadline for the uh, for the agenda to be turned in. Not There are not a meeting schedule for that. Any days of the week work better? better. The seventh, Monday the seventh. Seventh, July. Work for you, Andy. Out, out. Yes. When? Work. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to do it at one in the afternoon, or do you want to do it at ten in the morning? Ten in the morning. I would. So one in the afternoon. One o'clock on Monday the seventh. And I'll arrange for a room. And let you know that uh, 
the uh, unfinished business item on our agenda is the revised policy for refunds. Two months ago, the uh, board approved the idea of placing a time limit on the period when refunds will be uh, provided, limiting that to, a, to a, a, a callback of 12 months. But we ask that a policy be drafted that specifically address the overall subject of, of uh, refunds and that also address what kind of periodic policy reminders would be provided to residents about these. And so the material that you have in your board packet, the manager has uh, prepared. Uh, this kind of action will require publication in the Oakland News before it would become effective. But before we publish it, uh, you know, I think it would be helpful if you have any questions or comments about uh, what has been drafted. As you can see, for instance, uh, under item 1B, under dues, it specifically states they'll be refund eligible for 12 months prior to the date of the notification. But you can also see under item 2 on transactions that go on in the office that it proposes to charge $25 for all new residents receiving an access card. The philosophy being proposed here is that if you charge for that card, it will be taken care of better and will charge $50 if it has to be replaced. But more importantly, we'll give a refund of $25 when you leave which is not stated in the proposed policy, Cassie, and I think would need to be added. But the concept is we want to get those cards back so that they can be more effective as, a, as an access tool. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Are those cards... Uh able to be killed, able to be um, yeah. taken off. Yeah. Yes. So if somebody loses a, loses a card, it can be basically uh, deactivated. Right. And, and there's no great loss to Oakmont itself, no. OBA itself. But it costs the person who wants a replacement $50. $50. And they're, they don't really cost us very much to produce, do they? No. Both of these are really just incentive steps to maintain control. But, but they do cost us something to produce. In a box. That's all? Thank you. Bob? I just had a question like... How often does it happen? How often do people come in and ask for new cards because they lost a card? And you have to deactivate. This isn't going to be a big money maker. I, I know That's you're not, not trying to make money. Yeah, it's not point. the intent. I don't know. Fifty seems. It just seems pretty steep. That's why I asked. It just from past experience if you make it meaningful people will uh, be more conscientious it also discourages people from lending it to someone else who's not even supposed to be here because if something happens to it it's coming out of your pocket it just seems to me it'd be a step in the process of tightening up our, our management of uh, identification Does it take much work, Cassie, to add to uh, paragraph 2B a reference about a refund when the cards are returned? Not at all. Do I have a motion to adopt the policy for refunds uh, with the uh, 
with the correction in paragraph 2D to include a sentence providing for refunds when cards are returned? Moved by Ann Allen. Moved by Allen, seconded by Francis. Discussion? I have a question. Pansy, is the refund going to be $25 or if it's a replacement card, it's $50? Is there always going to be $25 for the refund? Yes. All in favor? I have uh, notes that I keep about both future workshop and future board meeting agendas. Item 13 is on our today's agenda for your recommendations as far as agenda items to make sure that we get on the either workshop or board meeting. Do you have any you want to pass on to? Architecture control process and procedures. As a workshop item? Would you take the lead on preparing some background discussion that you could circulate it at a time for us? Don, did you want to talk about the uh, fence and parking situation? I'll be glad to put it down. You're talking about this. Uh, I may have something depending on the answer. Uh, Eleanor, uh, have you, has your committee made any progress or thoughts on the vehicle access to the to the plaza and something that we might want to discuss next month? I have, I have something in the paper. Did you do uh, I didn't see it yet. Thank you. Yes. So that it, won't, it won't require any further discussion at the next meeting? Got it down. Thank you. I appreciated your art, art owner. I think it told the story very nicely. Thank you. Kathy, do we have anything on the task list? Any other items for board's attention? Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned. One hour and 45 minutes. Is that too long? Is that good or bad? Probably a wreck.